We would like to apologize to you, our audience, for the delay in transmission due to technical difficulties at the international level. We are transmitting live to you from San Diego, California, using facilities of KPBS located on the campus of San Diego State University. Welcome. Bienvenidos. Jorge Aldinis. Bienvenidos to the program Organizational Change. This is the second video conference of the series entitled Management System for the 21st Century, produced by the International Training Center at San Diego State University. We remind you of the option available for receiving a certificate of participation from the International Training Center at the end of this six program series. For more information, you may contact your country coordinator. We welcome our participants who are dispersed among more than 70 cities within the United States, Mexico, Honduras, Brazil, Paraguay, and Turkey. Warmest greetings to the Distinguished Organization of American States in Washington, D.C., and to the private educational institutions which participate for the first time in Istanbul and North Cyprus. We are thankful for the, both the cooperation of Telecom from Mexico and IDV Broadcast, Comset, and Panamsam, which have permitted us to have an incredible connection between five satellites in order to cover the three continents, America, Europe, and Asia. It is also a pleasure to inform you that during our next video conference, which is programmed for the 4th of May, we will present the theme Teamwork. The Pacific region will be participating with various receptor sites in Hawaii, Japan, and possibly more countries from that area. Through this, we will advance in our important mission to unite the international community in this great common tax to both improve everyone's standard of living by way of direct transfer of knowledge and to thrive towards a global economy. My name is Armando Osorio. I will be your moderator during this teleconference where we will analyze both the fascinating and current subject organizational change seen as a technology in management and development. It is a pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jim Velasco, an expert, a professor in management, an entrepreneur, a consultant, and author of various books on organizational change. Among his most recent publications, he has Flight of the Buffalo, which is internationally famous. Before you start your lecture, we would like to hear your comments. Dr. Velasco, which are the fundamental challenges which the executives face within their own organizations in order to maintain themselves as leaders in their field? I think there are two fundamental challenges that every organization faces. I think the first one is to gain line of sight to customers for every single person in the organization. If everyone in the organization is not responsible for planning what we must be for customers in the future, we will all be a thing of the past. First biggest challenge. The second biggest challenge is to change the leadership style, change the management style so we can make the first happen. If we don't change our leadership style, if we continue to be buffaloes as opposed to lead geese, we will never get everyone to be responsible for creating that, what, that future based upon what we must be for customers. Recently, literature having to do with human resources has, resources has made reference to empowerment, the delegation of power or transfer of responsibility to the employee. Can the implementation of this strategy be perhaps the solution in order to increase productivity in the decade of the 90s? Empowerment aptly, aptly is essential if we, will, if, if we must get everyone responsible for creating that future of what we must be for customers. But empowerment per se is not the answer. It is empowerment plus an external focus on customers that makes the difference. And we're going to cover that in the coming segment right now. Thank you. We now ask that you initiate your lecture. I've been in the field of business for approximately 43 years. For the first 30 of those years, I knew exactly what my role was. I knew exactly what I had to do. I had to plan. I had to organize. I had to coordinate. I had to control. If there were decisions to be made in my company, I had to make them. If there were actions to be taken, I had to be certain that the right person took the right actions. And all too often, that right person was me because I couldn't trust anybody else to do it as well as I could do it. 
And for the first 30 years or so of my business life, that worked. And then an event occurred that caused me to rethink what I taught in my classrooms, what I wrote about in my books, what I whispered in the ears of the people with whom I consulted, and most importantly of all, what I practiced in my own organization. I attended the funeral of a friend of mine, a fellow business owner here in San Diego. He was coming home late one night from a late night meeting, went off the road and died. And as I sat in the funeral hall and listened to the kind words about my friend, I realized there but for the grace of God went I. Because I could remember driving furiously down that very same stretch of highway many times at midnight at 90 to 100 miles an hour looking to get my weary bones into the bed so I could make my 5 a.m. phone call and attend my 6 a.m. meeting. My briefcase was as thick as his. It had literally been five years since I'd had a real vacation. There but for the grace of God went I. And as I sat in that hall and listened to the words, I began to ask myself some questions. Why am I working so hard, I asked myself. Why am I spending all these hours? Am I looking to build a big business? Or am I looking to build a big funeral that I'll never get to enjoy? Am I working all these hours to please myself? Or am, am, am I working all these hours to uh, make my wife's next husband very happy with all the money I'm going to leave her? I decided that making him, whoever he was going to be, very happy was not my purpose in life. And so I decided things had to be different. And that launched my journey. My journey in search of what really makes for an effective organization. What kind of leadership really makes for an organization that truly delivers great performance for its customers. That truly provides a platform for the people within it to learn and grow. An organization within which you did not have to live to work, but you could work to live. Too many friends of mine in the executive ranks have looked at their child in the cradle, and then the next time they've spent any considerable time with that child is when that individual graduates from college. And where did all the soccer games go and all the holidays go? No, the purpose is to build an organization where you uh, don't live to, live to work, but you work to live. In the course of the 13 years that I've been on this journey, I've learned several terrible truths. I'd like to share three of them with you today, and then to share five going forward realities, which I think shape our business world today and our business world tomorrow. And then to share with you a process of how to deal with these realities and capitalize on them to build an organization which really is a place where great people come to work and great people learn and grow. The first reality that I've learned, the first terrible truth, and it's a terrible truth, is that in truth, success is the enemy. That which got me to where I am won't get me to where I need to go. The corporate graveyard is littered with the bones of organizations that didn't realize that, or realize it too late. Take the Motorola personal page of division as just an example. In 1988, they won the Baldridge Award for having the best manufacturing plant in America. They were the best manufacturing plant in their business. They own 85% of the market today. If you have a pager, it is likely to be made by Motorola. The margins on those pages are obscene. They do very well. You would think that this is an opportunity to rest and relax. Here is success. You own the market, you have the best manufacturing plant, and your margins are great. In addition to which, this market is growing at the rate of 300% a year, tripling every year. Yet the fact of the matter is that Motorola understands that if it doesn't change dramatically, it could be gone in three years. Because you see that manufacturing plant that was the, the talk of the nation and the envy of the industry. In their benchmark study in 91, they were only average in the industry. And in 93, they found out of the seven major competitors, they were number eight. They went from best to worst in the space of less than five years. And while they own today 85% of the personal pager business and earn a considerable amount of money doing that, the fact of the matter is that the growth in this business is going to be not in the business market where they are currently very strong, but in the consumer market. And if you remember, Motorola has a very long history of failure in the consumer products business. So here is a business that is very successful today. But they recognize if they do not change,
They will be miserable failures in a very short tomorrow. The, the same problem confronted IBM and General Motors and so on. And they failed to respond. Giants and dinosaurs die out because they don't realize that that which got them to where they are will not get them to where they need to go. The same is true for me as an individual as is true for my organization. What worked for me yesterday in yesterday's environment was successful. Gave me the chance to do what I do today. But today's environment is different. If I continue to do what worked for me yesterday in today's very different world, I'm going to have trouble. Tomorrow promises to be different still. If I continue to do what worked for me yesterday in tomorrow's very different world, I'm going to have trouble. I'm bound to fail. That which got me to where I am will not get me to where I need to go. That which got my organization where it is will not get it to where it needs to go. The first terrible truth leads logically to the second terrible truth. I spent most of my adult life blaming they and them when things went wrong. It was very clear when things didn't work who was, who was at fault. It was those stupid government regulations made by bureaucrats who didn't understand my business. It were those competitors who kept insisting on selling things under cost in order to gain market share. It was those customers who didn't realize the great benefits I was bringing to them. It was those employees who didn't do the right thing like I told them to do. It was very clear. The problem was they and them. It wasn't until I recognized that the basic problem in my organization looked back at me in the mirror every morning. It wasn't until I realized that in truth, I am the problem. And the thing that, the series of, of experiences that brought this home to me so clearly was, I had the privilege of serving as the personal coach to the former president of the former Soviet Union. For the last 18 months of his time in office, I split my time between San Diego State and the Kremlin. And the single biggest reason Mikhail Gorbachev is no longer the president of the Soviet Union, and there is no longer a Soviet Union, is because the very thing that got Mikhail Gorbachev to the pinnacle of power, the presidency of his country, blinded him from seeing the realities of the changes he needed to make to bring his country and himself into the marketplace economy of the 20th century. And one event so clearly symbolizes that for me. We spent six hours one day as he attempted to resolve whether he would sign a decree or not. He had promised a decree publicly. It was prepared on his desk ready to sign. Yet he agonized for six hours of whether he would sign it or not. Finally, in a fit of frustration, he threw up his hand and said, I know, I know, I know what I must do. My head knows what I must do. But my heart won't let my lips say the words. My heart won't let my hand sign the decree. And at the end of the day, he didn't sign the decree. One more nail in his coffin. And I've heard those words from the lips of United States presidents. I've heard those words from the lips of many large, or, of, of the leaders of many large organizations. I've heard those words from my lips as well. I know what I have to do. I know what's got to be done. Yet somehow or other, I can't get myself to do it on a regular basis. You see, there's no doubt in my mind that my organization reflects me. As I stand in front of you today, there are 1,400 people all across this globe who are asking themselves one very simple question. What does Belasco want? How would Belasco handle it? And the fact of the matter is, it was very clear what I wanted. What I wanted was this. I wanted to have a herd of buffalo. Because you see, buffaloes are very strange animals. Buffaloes are loyal to one leader. They are dependent on them to tell them what to do. In addition to which, they do exactly what they're told to do. And when they're not told what to do, they stand around and wait for instructions. And the truth of the matter is that because they stand around and wait, that what happens is that buffaloes on the plains wind up like this in cans on shelves in supermarkets. And buffalo organizations with lots of people standing around waiting for the word from the boss also wind up in coffins in the morgue of corporations. The fact of the matter is that organizations with buffaloes do not survive because there is too much lost time, too much slow time to respond. I realized that as I was working 16, 17, 18 hours a day. I realized things had to be different. So I did the only thing I knew how to do. I ordered my organization to be different. 
I ordered my organization to change. You see, now I had a different picture in mind. Rather than a herd of dependent buffaloes standing around waiting for me to tell them what to do, what I really wanted to have was a flock of interdependent geese. Now, these geese are wonderful birds. You see, every goose understands that if it doesn't leave the north and follow the flock south every fall, it won't see spring. It doesn't wait for the leader to tell it what to do. It doesn't wait for somebody else to order it. It understands it must get there, and it knows it is responsible for getting itself to wherever the whole flock is going. In addition to which, because the people at the front of the flock encounter the most wind resistance, they get tired the faster, so they have to drop back in the flock. And then someone else from the middle of the flock flies up, and they assume the leadership position. What this means is that every member of the flock needs to know exactly where the whole flock is going. Is that true in most organizations today? That's true actually in very few organizations today. I know it wasn't true in my organization. In addition to which, every goose has got to be willing to assume leadership. Every goose needs to be willing to fly up to the point and assume leadership position. Is that true in most organizations? Typically not. In fact, the most typical response is, it's not my job. I don't do that. Somebody else does that as opposed to being willing to step up to the line and assume a leadership position. In addition to which, these geese aptly understand that the only way to make this journey is through commitment, commitment to each other. So that when a goose on this journey, this very long journey, several thousand mile journey, gets ill or gets hit by a shot and goes down, several other geese follow it down, feed it and protect it until it gets better or dies. And then the remaining geese strike out in the direction of the overall flock. Is that true in most organizations? Most organizations I know of could best be described as a whole bunch of individuals, each with their own individual goals, each in their own individual boat, each rowing furiously to accomplish their individual goals. And if somebody else gets a little bit ahead, the first reaction is to reach over and poke a hole in the bottom of that person's boat. That does not sound like cooperation. In addition to which, these geese are very smart. They understand that as the nature of the work changes, they have to reorganize themselves. So they fly in a V, a design perfectly designed for flying. But when they land, they reorganize themselves and land in waves. And when they feed, they reorganize themselves again and they feed in fours. We should be so smart. The typical organization today, with its carefully crafted and separated functional organizations, more nearly resembles the German army of 1872 than a modern organization designed to provide quality products and superior service in a fast cycle time to market. We have the production department clearly organized into one separate set of group. And then we have them separate from the quality department. It's usually the next building. We don't want them to see too much about what's really going on in production. Then we have over here, we have the accounting department. They're normally in the next, in the next province or in the next county or in the next state because we don't want them to really know what's going on. And then we have the sales, we have the sales organization. They're out in the field, whatever that means. What it really means is they're not back in the office, back in the factory where things really happen. Everyone is neatly organized in their own little compartments, their own functional silos called departments. We absolutely know that the functional organization is the death of quality. We know that the functional organization is the antithesis of service. We know that the functional organization is the paragon of high cost. And yet we continue to organize ourselves that way. We are not nearly as smart as those geese. Now, in truth, all of these wonderful facts I learned after the fact. The real reason I wanted to have a flock of geese as opposed to a herd of dependent buffalo was the fact that the flock of geese, through cooperation, is able to go 171% further than any single goose. And so what I wanted in my organization was that 171% performance. And so I did the only thing I knew how to do. I ordered my buffaloes to fly. <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> they didn't. The more I ordered them to fly, the more rooted to the ground they were. The more I urged them to be different, the more they insisted on being the same. It was then I learned terrible truth number three. Terrible truth number three 
is that since organization performance one is a function of my behavior A, if I want organization performance two, I have to change my behavior to behavior B first. In other words, for things to change in my organization, I have to change first. So the biggest problem in change is not the, is not the problem of how I get them to change. The biggest problem in change is how I get me to change. The biggest problem, the, the largest governor on the rate of speed with which, I can ch with which my organization can change is not their ability to change, it is my ability to change. So for the last 13 years I've been working on how to be a different kind of a leader, how to lead in a different kind of a way, how to be a leader that empowers as opposed to a leader that orders, how to be a leader that really works to help other people achieve success rather than focusing only on my own success. I'd like to tell you that I've solved the problem. I'd like to tell you that I've got a magic answer. Just stay tuned and participate with us and you will learn all that you need to know. The truth of the matter is that you will not learn all you need to know in the following hour that we're going to share. The truth of the matter is that buying my book will not help you be, a, will not instantly guarantee that you will be a different transformed kind of a leader. This takes hard work. It takes a lot of hard work followed by even more hard work, followed by even more hard work. It is the single most difficult thing I have ever done in my 58 years worth of living, is learning how to be a different kind of a leader. But I understand that it's very important. It is probably the single most important thing I will do in my lifetime. I wish I could tell you that, that my organization reflects that wonderfully soaring flock of geese. We're in the software and services business, my company is. We uh, started 11 years ago. Last year, 1993, we did approximately uh, $1.6 billion worth of worldwide revenue. We have uh, 1,400 people who work out of 59 offices worldwide, range from India, across the two ponds, across Europe, and even across the Urals in the Russian Republic. Last year, on that $1.6 billion worth of revenue, we had a net after-tax profit of 36.2%. And the average earnings for the 1,400 people in the firm came to 252,000 United States dollars, which is not bad, considering the fact that we're just figuring out how to make this business really work. But in truth, ladies and gentlemen, this is how we really are. You see, we're still buffaloes. But we have got ourselves veed up, number one. Number two, we've eliminated the head buffalo syndrome. And number three, we are all signed up for flying lessons. Because we absolutely recognize that the challenge for us is how do we learn how to let other people lead so that we can all together collectively soar to excellence. All of this suggests a very different definition of empowerment, a very different definition of the way in which empowerment takes place. In my first book, teaching the elephant to dance, empowering change in your organization. I use the term empowerment a great deal. In the last several four years, it's perhaps the word has lost some of its meaning. So let me give you a new definition. Empowerment is not something that comes from the top down. You don't empower anyone. Empowerment is not something you grant to somebody else. Empowerment comes because individuals want to be responsible. Empowerment comes from the inside out rather than from the top down. Let me give you an example of what I mean. I'll paint a picture, if you like, of what empowerment really is. You know a person is empowered when they grab you by the throat and rush you to the ground and demand the responsibilities they need in order to do their jobs. Now, empowerment does not mean abdication. It doesn't mean you hand the job off and say, well, you do it, I'm going to go play golf. Empowerment does not mean that everyone is free to do whatever they like. Empowerment is not the right to do as you please. Empowerment is to be pleased to do what's right. And here is the red thread that runs throughout almost everything you're going to hear today from Jim Belasco. Empowerment is the right, is to be pleased to do what's right for our customers. So empowerment is always focused on doing what's right for our customers. Doing what's right for them who feed us, who keep us, who help us to prosper. It's all based around customers. And the last key point about empowerment is empowerment is not a large poster on a wall. It's not a four-color job. It is not something you put on a badge. Empowerment is not a big program. 
in Parliament is not big speakers. Former President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, put it best in 1904 when he said, do what you can with what you have where you are. The theme of empowerment, empowerment begins right here. Empowerment begins right now. And empowerment begins with you. We now begin with our first demonstrative question and answer session. You can send your question by fax 619-594-8178 or by calling directly to the studio 619-265-1021. Dr. Dr. Velasco, we have another question from the Technological Institute of Villahermosa. Which is uh, the precise time within a company in which you should uh, begin organizational change, and how you, should you know that that is the time? I think that I think change needs to begin with creating a sense of urgency. And that sense of urgency comes from getting as many people as possible in direct contact with customers, getting as many people as possible out searching for what are the best practices as they compare what they do with other companies with whom they compete, and really getting in touch with what your competitors are doing in the marketplace. That sense of urgency must precede any other change. We're receiving also another question from the Technological Institute of Villahermosa through fax. Can you have a dual organization, one of a flock and one of a herd within your company? I think most organizations are mixtures of both herds and flocks. And I think in some parts of an organization, you may in fact need a herd organization in some parts. But most organizations are filled with transitions. We are moving from being a herd organization and on our way to becoming flocks. And in fact, in truth, I think most of us will always be buffaloes because the world keeps changing so rapidly. We are always rooted to the ground, always looking up, always looking to get to be better. We have also another question from the Technological Institute of Villahermosa by fax. In which type of a company do you recommend the herd strategy in order to obtain better results? I think that some organizations work, for instance, in very in in modestly changing or very slowly changing uh, kinds of environments. I think you look at organizations like government as an example. Government is one in which I think you need a lot of buffaloes who are busy carrying out rules. You need to be careful, however, in talking about buffaloes in government, because I'm, I'm working with the Vice President here in the United States, to help the federal government, a three million person organization, to become less buffalo-like. Even in that organization, a slowly changing organization, slowly changing environment, you need to have individuals, some individuals, who are geese, who are willing to strike out and are willing to soar on their own, interdependently with others. Gracias, Dr. Velasco. Dr. Velasco will continue with his presentation, but we can receive more questions during the next session. These three terrible truths form the backdrop against which, against which the present reality is going to be played. There are five things, five trends, five themes in the current reality that I'd like to share with you that I've seen, which I think impact our business today and our impact our business going forward tomorrow. The first theme is, the first current reality is the value equation. If you really want to have economic results, margins and market share, the only way to get those, the almost invariably, it cuts across all industries, the only way to get that is through customer satisfaction. And the only way to get customer satisfaction is through associate or employee productivity and satisfaction. So therefore, if you really want to have economic results, margins and market share, the best way to achieve those economic results is through focusing on how do we create the conditions where employees feel productive and satisfied. Now notice I put productivity before satisfaction because 80 years of academic research